Good afternoon, I'm Alex Korapov, uh, NOAA NOS, working at uh, Coastal Survey Development Lab. This is work in collaboration with Jinta uh, Shui from COPS. Uh, and also let me uh, acknowledge our data providers for uh, satellite SST, Alexander Ignatov, and uh, Eric Levert provided not just data, but advice, weak advice on uh, Using, uh, calls, uh, on using altimetry, and they're both from STAR. So this is a regional ocean forecast system, the West Coast ocean forecast system, and it's pretty uh, far along uh, in the process. We plan to re transition to NCO operations uh, in uh, FY21, end of this year. Uh, so our goals is to provide uh, like three day update, updates of three day forecasts of coastal currents, temperature, salinity, France, total cost to sea level, like everything that's uh, of use to, for navigation, for precision navigation and uh, fisheries, uh, storm uh, uh, search and rescue, uh, things like this. So when I say coastal currents, I mean mostly like shelf currents and uh, currents in a offshore zone. Uh, the model is based on a regional ocean modeling system, uh, which is quite suitable model for describing uh, coastal flows. And uh, I'm glad to see that uh, Hernan Aranga, the chief architect of uh, ROMS, is uh, online right, with us on this session. Uh, so that uh, we are using the 4 dvr component of ROMS uh, to simulate satellite altimetry, SST, and uh, surface currents from HF radars. I'll show some examples if you don't know what they are. Uh, the model forecast will be provided at 4 kilometers uh, horizontal resolution. We are looking for the ways to improve resolution in the future, but the first uh, release will be at 4 kilometer. So in addition to that, we also have run uh, ROMs at high resolution, like for multiple years uh, without a simulation, 2 kilometer resolution. Those are great tools for skill assessment, basic research and seasonal and, and interannual variability, and which is relevant to fisheries, for instance. Uh, <clears throat> so just to orient you, uh, so the, the dominant, most dominant feature on the, on the west coast of the United States of America is uh, uh, some upwelling. This is wind driven. That's why we need uh, good winds provided by uh, MWP, NWP models. Uh, so, and those uh, winds drive strong currents and seasonal upwelling. Cold water is also rich in nutrients so that makes it ecologically very productive area, which makes this area in turn a very economic important, economically important area for fisheries. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, as I said, drones will be run at 4 kilometer resolution with data simulation. Uh, we use 40 terrain uh, following vertical layers. Uh, relevant to UFS, we have to mention what we are using now for atmospheric forcing and boundary conditions. We are using no none, 12 kilometer resolution. Uh, and these are the variables listed here. The variables listed here will be, will, will be are provided to uh, ROMs, and we use bulk, bulk flux uh, formulation in, inside ROMs to compute uh, uh, momentum uh, flux, at, uh, heat flux, and salinity flux at the surface. Uh, at the open boundaries, this is a big domain. Uh, uh, we use uh, uh, outputs from global RTOFs. It's a no global model constrained by data simulation. And I put those two things in red because, because like, we know like NAM will be graciously uh, retired uh, sometime soon. And we also saw in plans yesterday that uh, when UFS coupled UFS model is in full glory, which is FY24, remarkably quite close to us. Uh, so this will be retired and we'll, we'll have to use UFS products to force uh, high resolution models apparently, right? Uh, so uh, anyway, so users I have mentioned already, uh, precision navigation is the main goal here. So commercial ships go about uh, like 15 to 20 nodes actually never go to they built uh, to go 20 nodes, but uh, they prefer to go like 18, 20, if you talk talk about this, ships like this shown here. Uh, so they prefer not to go against the two knot current. Uh, so uh, surface currents can be used for ship routing in fuel conservation. Uh, this is even more important for fisheries because fisher, uh, fishery boats go like eight nodes, like seiners and stuff. Uh, <clears throat> so they do like to ride, uh, ride coastal currents to get to the place where the fish are and they don't want to go against the current. Uh, they also want to know where the SST fronts are, that's where the like, tuna are, and they want to know the surface mix layer depths where the Columbia River plume is, and our hope that we can improve to kind of provide useful information of all of those. Also, surface currents can be uh, 
used to track uh, flow trajectories during environmental hazard response, search and rescue, and all the other applications listed here. And also the important to mention that already now the outputs from this uh, product are used as boundary conditions for high resolution coastal uh, uh, in estuarian models. So uh, a note on 4 var data simulation. Again, we are using the data simulation component built inside the ROMs. It's like a black box for us. It's good and bad. Uh, we try not to break it. That's the main thing. And uh, uh, so every day we do two things. We do the forecast cycle predicting currents and temperatures salinity for three days from now. And also every day we run the 40 hour cycle over three day period plus three days. Uh, and that provides the, the, bound, the initial conditions for the next day run. So 40 hour uses the tangent linear and joint ROMS components and provides dynamically based time and space interpolation of sparse and noisy data sets. That's why we like 40 hour. It's an expensive method, but having like a lot of gaps in data, very sparse coverage, it should use like one of the best uh, uh, data simulation methods developed. Uh, so uh, just examples of data we simulate. We simulate satellite SST. This is the mosaic of uh, for just from one day from one satellite, and you see like a lot of clouds. So basically, by using three satellites, we can reduce the clouds uh, for a given day. And by using those uh, images in three-day window, we can uh, provide kind of full image to the, for the initial conditions, right? So second, we use the satellite altimeters. Uh, those are measure surface elevation with respect to the satellite. And then kind of what we try to get from it is the so-called absolute dynamic topography, which is uh, kind of indicative of uh, non-tidal sea uh, level variation, and that's connected to the just perfect surface uh, currents. So this uh, uh, plot on the left shows the map in the whole area of, of uh, satellite tracks from five satellites that we are using right now. One is the US satellite, and the rest of them are uh, European, I understand. So pretty good coverage, some gaps, but the, when you go to the next cycle, kind of those gaps will be filled little by little. Uh, so kind of full, the units here are meters. I do apologize, didn't put the units here. And, and you can see a lot of low and highs because we have to add uh, tides, uh, model tides to uh, absolute dynamic topography to match it to the model. Uh, if, if you look at along each track, you can find those uh, large variations over a scale of like 50 kilometers or so. And those usually correspond to places where the France are with strong currents or edges, and that's what that's kind of information you want to get from this data. Uh, uh, lastly, we simulate uh, high frequency ra radar surface currents. So if you look along the shore, there are about like 20 plus installations like this uh, on the shore. So this uh, each antenna sends the electromagnetic signal into the ocean, that returns, and by know knowing that uh, backscatter plus some knowledge about uh, basic uh, wave dynamics, they will try to deduce the uh, currents associated with the, the circulation, like from tides to wind-driven circulation, edges, and so forth. Uh, and we can get six kilometer resolution maps hourly. An example is shown here for the scale of this area. Is, this, this bay is San Francisco Bay, so if you know the area. So, so we go pretty far offshore with these currents. Uh, so basically, we combine all of those uh, all those data in the data simulation machine. And I, I'm not trying to impress you with all the uh, skill assessments. We've done just one uh, picture to show this is the model without a simulation. Kind of almost knows qualitatively there is appealing there, but it cannot represent, kind of give you the structure of the appealing front correctly because that was governed by intrinsic uh, 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 nonlinear dynamics. So the observations for the sea surface temperature in color and HF radar currents shown on the, on the left. We haven't simulated those yet in this product, and our day one forecast is shown in the middle. So qualitatively, at least, the shape of the uh, appealing front is more correct than the model without a simulation. And uh, there is also quantitative improvement if you look at RMS errors. Uh, so uh, this is my last slide. And uh, <clears throat> I think, uh, first of all, in general terms, like we have coastal ocean models with kind of sort of some of us know better how we fit in the UFS idea and some of us don't. And I uh, concur with Andre Van der Verheizen's uh, comments that he made yesterday in the plenary talk. And this is just a snapshot from uh, his uh, slideshow. 
kind of we need to develop a 3D also modern strategy that's relevant to UFS, I think, right? So where do we fit with all this high resolution S2 island models, coastal models? Uh, from my for myself personally, there is a list of things where I see we can fit. As uh, it's, it's not too early to start uh, checking the utility of uh, FE3 atmospheric fields and the impact on the accuracy of coastal surface currents, uh, temperature, salinity, and everything. Uh, also for the UFS oceanic boundary conditions, we want to see the utility of say M16 to force uh, uh, high resolution models, especially given the projection that GR TOFs will be retired uh, FY24. By the way, Artov's almost made it to NCO operations this year, right? So <clears throat> quite a new model. <laughs> so we can do comparative tests of ROMs and MOM6 in shelf areas, ROMs uh, analysis, like proven by like thousands of papers in coastal areas, and it's proven that this model has qualitative quantitative skills. So we want to know if MOM6 in this, given the same resolution will give you the same result or better. Uh, finally, for 4 dvr it's great to have Hernan on online, maybe he'll explain us what was going on. So Jedi enabled 4 dvr So uh, I understand somehow the uh, ROMs developers would have to change the structure of the code to make it Jedi compliant. For us users, the potential advantages possibly include uh, more options to provide background area, to play with background area error covariances and to treat data, to provide your own data functions, which is especially uh, important for altimetry and HF radar data. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Um, Jeff, are there any questions? Nope, nothing in Slack. All right, and I think for the interest of time, we need to move along, but um, definitely post anything to the Slack channel if there's follow-up. So if you could um, stop sharing your screen, and then if Greg could uh, share his for the next presentation. All right, our next speaker is um, Gregory, oh, here we go, is Gregory um, Soroka, and he'll be speaking on extratropical surge and tide operational forecast system, global update and future development. So please go ahead. Thank you. Can you see my uh, presentation screen? Yes. Okay, great. So thank you. Uh, so I'm in uh, Alex's branch uh, at Coast Survey Development Lab um, in National Ocean Service. Um, and uh, I'm here to talk to you about uh, a 2D inundation model that you know, Alex referenced in the, uh, the last slide there, um, the SDOFS model. So we've recently upgraded to a global configuration, and then I'll talk to you about some uh, future development. And just want to say, uh, Sergey Vinogradov uh, and Yuji were primary developers at NOAA uh, for this, um, and they they did a tremendous job along with Notre Dame uh, colleagues, uh, providing a lot of support for the global mesh development. <clears throat> so uh, just to talk about the core model description, which is AdCERC, uh, AdCERC and UFS, and then descriptions of the current configuration of SDOFs, uh, the global SDOFs, and some validation, um, and then some acknowledgments and references. Uh, so the, the core model, again, is the AdCERC model. Uh, so uh, it's a high-resolution, high-fidelity, finite element model uh, that allows us to represent the, the nonlinear in interactions between the tides and the storm surge. Um, and so it also can handle inundation as well. Uh, because of the unstructured grids that you see here um, depicted, uh, it can handle large scale domains while still having high near shore resolution. Um, and uh, we've developed uh, with the help of Said and other colleagues in NOAA and outside of NOAA, uh, the NEMS NUOPSI uh, caps uh, for uh, AdCERC. Um, and then some more details on the, the version of AdCERC that is implemented uh, right now, version 55. Uh, so the benefits uh, right now, AdCERC is a part of uh, the UFS, uh, and so um, there are benef multiple benefits. Uh, it's a community model with a lar very large user base, uh, so it's in that community model uh, spirit. Um, it represents, again, the physics, the ties, the storm surge interactions between the two very well, um, variable resolution, it's, it's computationally efficient, um, and uh, it allows for operational global AdCERC model like uh, global SDOFs to be coupled to the other UFS components, for example, Wave Watch 3. Um, and uh, AdCERC, just to note, will be a part of the UFS Coastal Applications team led by Shahak uh, Piyuri of NOS. He's the uh, chief of uh, CSDL um, addressing coastal inundation. And I just circle here the coastal modeling systems that AdCERC's a part of. 
Um, so uh, currently, uh, SDOFS, again, is using AdCERC. Um, it's a deterministic, continually running uh, water level forecast driven by GFS, atmospheric uh, wind, sea level pressure, and now ice. Uh, and it computes the tidal component, the surge component, and their combination. Uh, four cycles a day, uh, six hour now cast, followed by a seven day forecast, uh, disseminated via AWIPS and NOMADS, and also provides the boundary conditions to the downstream near shore wave prediction system. Uh, so currently, uh, ESTA specific, Atlantic, and Micronesia are the three domains since 2014, 12, and 14 for those three. Uh, but there are gaps in the coverage. So Western Alaska, America, Samoa, foreign territories. And then also there are new operational needs, uh, unification of the modeling infrastructure for SDOFs, uh, reduction of bias and errors uh, to the re removal of the open ocean boundaries here, um, inclusion of internal tide dissipation, uh, sea ice effect on wind drag and the bias correction, which I'll give some more details on. So uh, currently, uh, What's uh, being implemented in late October, hopefully of this year at NCEP is uh, the global SDOF. So this is the mesh, um, again, with a uh, huge help from Notre Dame and uh, some other colleagues in NOAA uh, to provide a mesh that's 8 million nodes uh, and we provide point output at 558 locations. Um, the coastal resolutions, uh, if you remember Andre's plenary talk yesterday, we're hoping for 50 to 100 meters to resolve the uh, small scale processes and features in the near shore and estuaries. Uh, so we have up to 80 meters for Hawaii and U.S. West Coast, up to 120 meters for U.S. East Coast, Puerto Rico, Micronesia, and Alaska. And then uh, just to give an idea of the, for the inundation, up to six meters above mean sea level for U.S. East Coast and for Pacific Islands up to 20 meters. Uh, so uh, here's a map of the bathymetry. Uh, so we have the configuration here, uh, the eight tidal constituents. Uh, we include internal tides with this configuration, self-attraction and loading, and also ice from GFS. Uh, and we have a 12-second time, uh, time step in the explicit mode. So here's a bias correction. Uh, we, we introduce this every cycle. We compute it and we apply it using a two-day average water level anomaly. So the anomaly is uh, uh, defined as the ob observations at the tidal stations minus, minus the tidal predictions. So we're basically correcting for the residual, assuming the tides are perfect. The model uh, is not uh, resolving some of the small scale processes, river flow, wave setup, et cetera. So uh, we try to re uh, reduce that bias um, with this inverted barometer, uh, about one millibar per one centimeter to maintain the offset, both in the now cast and the forecast. Um, and then uh, we compute these at the tide stations and then we interpolate spatially between the, the stations to get it onto the mesh. Uh, so just a quick uh, validation, it performs and reduces the bias uh, very well um, at the tidal stations for these different storms. So you see here in the top right, the uncorrected in red, corrected in blue, and then observed uh, in black. Uh, and so uh, for the most part, uh, a significant improvement for Sandy, Matthew, Hermine, and Katrina, um, and then uh, a smaller improvement for Ike. Uh, so. Uh, we provide these uh, every six hours on WCOS, the, the coastal water level offsets. We plot here at all tide stations um, that are available. And then again, we interpolate to the Pacific, Atlantic, and uh, Micronesia we do not do because uh, there's only four stations. Uh, but then uh, we, we are doing this for the global mesh as well. Uh, so this can be a product that uh, can be available for forecasters. And so just uh, giving a brief idea of the uh, products that are available to the forecasters, other ones, so this is the tidal prediction across the global mesh um, at one time, um, and then the surge water levels, and then the combined water levels of those two um, in meters. And then uh, this is a maximal elevation for one forecast cycle across the seven days uh, to give, you know, the, the extreme uh, prediction for uh, forecasters. Uh, and then uh, some time series that are available, again, at those 558 locations and then where there's observations in green, we plot here. Um, and so we, we calculate at each station, uh, room mean square error, peak, the lag in the peak, et cetera, the bias. And then we, we can look at the internally accepted criteria, uh, you know, for example, 20, meter, uh, 20 centimeters for RMSD and if it meets that. Um, and then here's some other examples of the tidal signal and some storm uh, related signals. Um, and then the, we can also plot the root mean square error in meters um, at each station, the bias 
Um, and then uh, we plot out for, uh, the average uh, statistics for uh, each of the configurations for one cycle. So you see here global, Atlantic, Pacific, and Micronesia. And we're generally, again, aiming for 20 centimeter error uh, in the results. Um, so the future of global SDOFs, um, we are hoping to couple global SDOFs to the UFS applications. So um, whether it's the national water model or global RTOFs, but again, like Alex said, the, it might be uh, into retired in the near future. Uh, but we're working on the new OPSI caps and the coupling applications and other model applications to do this. Um, we are also looking at a high pri national priority region in the Pacific Ocean to enhance the, the model output uh, so that with higher resolution and improved mesh there and key ports, um, improvement of the bathymetry, and then also the skill assessment uh, used throughout these to evaluate the improvements. And then finally, I would like to say uh, there's some efforts to improve the computational efficiency of AdCERC um, using community efforts. So uh, the dynamic load balancing, uh, for example, if there are dry nodes across a whole simulation um, at certain checkpoints, uh, we balance out the load so that each CPU is, is running uh, efficiently. Uh, and so this increases, it minimizes the cost of the dry regions and uh, increases the, the runtime and also or decreases the runtime, increases accuracy. Um, and so I'd like to acknowledge uh, the University of Notre Dame colleagues again, um, which were a huge help in, the, in this model development, the National Weather Service colleagues, uh, Ocean Service, uh, University of North Carolina, um, and the Water Institute of the Gulf. And then uh, just some of the papers from Notre Dame here and other colleagues and then the bottom left uh, is about the bias correction. So if you want more details on one of the, you know, the background on that bias correction, uh, please look there. So I appreciate it. Uh, and thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. All right, thank you. Uh, I think we have time for a quick question or two, Jeff. Yeah, there are two questions on the Slack channel, um, but we sounds like we'll get to just one of them. Um, so Greg, if you want to take a look at the second afterwards. Um, the first one is, how are levees and flood control features handled? Is it linear elevation data, or is it just from a DEM? Or perhaps the focus is not on inundation flooding, but only on open water processes? Uh, to my knowledge, and Notre Dame and others can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they are included um, in the mesh, especially what can be resolved by the, the mesh. Um, so uh, we can provide more details on that if, if uh, offline. All right, thank you. Um, so moving on, so Greg, if you could um, sure. stop sharing and then our next speaker is Eric White. So if you could go ahead and share your um, presentation. Um, so uh, Eric White will be presenting analysis of stream channel properties and hydrolo hydrologic um, routing methodologies toward regional specific channel routing algorithms at a continental scale. Yeah, sorry, apologies for that mouthful of a, of a title there. Um, but yeah, so what I'm looking at here is going to be figuring out which hydraulic routing algorithms work the best and where, and trying to figure out sort of a priori um, where the national water model should be focusing on sort of full physics-based um, modeling of, of flood waves or where we can make some simplifying assumptions in in the algorithms. Um, and so first and foremost, i uh, just like to acknowledge the, the funding for this research. Uh, it's through the NOAA Joint Technology Transfer Initiative, and we're working with the National Water Center um, for looking at these improvements with the National Water Model. Um, and then in addition, uh, my uh, PhD advisor, Ehab, gave a talk yesterday that sort of is related to this, looking at more at the sort of the code and algorithm development and testing that goes along with this, this research. Um, so he gave that talk yesterday. So if you missed it, um, apologies. But uh, first, so this is more of a sort of basic, um, pure research, sort of improving algorithms that are very fundamental to the National Water Model, which is one of the components of, of the Unified Forecast System. I th it, I'm not going to talk about sort of the coupling and, and all of the data sets that are ingested and the forecasts that are that are prepared and used with this the model. This is really about sort of the, the physics that, that the model uses. And so um, the National Water Model, if uh, most of you may be familiar with it, 
but um, it is continental uh, over the, the continental United States. I provide several sort of time scales of forecasts, short term, medium term, and then ensembles for um, uh, those long term, long range forecasts as well. It uses atmospheric forcings and data assimilation from a variety of sensors and obviously forecast model output. Um, and then it, it handles the hydrology and the hydraulics um, differently. So the hydrology, so how much runoff is generated from rainfall and sort of where that's flowing over the land surface versus infiltrating into groundwater and having subsurface flows, those are modeled and they used the NOMP land surface model um, as well as um, just a whole slew of other components for the hydrology side. And then the hydraulic part. So once the water makes it into the main stem of, of the channels, it's routed using Wharf Hydro. I mean, it uses a simplified um, methodology for the same but shallow water equations, which is commonly referred to as the muskingum kunj equation. And it uses the National Hydrography data set, um, the, the NHD Plus version 2. Um, and so the, the crux of this, this research is really about those simplifying equations that we can use to represent hydraulic channel flow and when those equations sort of result in poor model performance of flood waves moving down a stream network and where we need to actually turn on some of the more complex physics to accurately model the flood wave um, in both time and magnitude of a continental reach. Um, hydraulic model. And so the same and not equations, really what we're looking at are the different um, terms in the conservation of momentum equation. And so if you look at the full same but not conservation of momentum, that's typically referred to as the dynamic wave solution. And that includes uh, the momentum due to the inertia gradient, a pressure gradient, gravity, and then friction. Um, if you ignore the inertia terms, that's commonly referred to as the diffusive wave. So that's only looking at pressure um, and then the gravity and friction slopes. Um, the Muskingum Kunj, which is what the, the National Water Model uses, doesn't use a full diffusive wave approach, but it does have some simplifying um, assumptions and approximations um, using sort of representative channel properties to, rep to estimate uh, the diffusive term. And then finally, the kinematic wave is the most simple and sort of least applicable in terms of the number of cases where that might actually be all you need to include in the algorithm. And so with obviously the more complex terms, you have improved accuracy and capturing of sort of a wider range of hydraulic conditions from the uh, backwater condition in a coastal zone or from a flooding and inundation of the floodplain component um, or from sort of steep hydraulic changes um, uh, the dynamic wave is really the, the creme de la creme of what you want, but it's computationally expensive and it's also prone to numerical instabilities. And so for that reason, um, it's typically not used in a lot of large scale modeling purposes and uh, the diffusive wave or even the, the simpler approaches are generally used. And so what we want to do is look at channel properties to determine what, um, when and where we are comfortable making these simplifying assumptions. And so there's a, a body of, of research that sort of identifies dimensionless scaling parameters. Some of these are, are really sort of common and well-known, the current number, fruit number, things like that. But there's also uh, through Ferric and then some work we did in a new paper, Maselli et al. 2020, um, looked at uh, particularly the FC term and the D term. And those are ratios um, that, that signify the importance of those different inertia and diffusion terms in the same but equations. And so sort of the, the background for this is looking at a variety of test cases. Here we have sort of the, the left column there is a real world um, river reach, the Red River in, in Shreveport, Louisiana, looking at a 1% um, annual exceedance probability flood wave coming down. I mean, so what, what this shows you is in the, the top plot, if you have normal depth, so no real backwater conditions, uh, that term FC is very high, it's greater than 10. So that's indicating that the inertia terms are an order of magnitude or greater, an order of magnitude smaller than the, the pressure and, and gravity terms. Um, whereas if you in, 
pose a backwater condition, um, that FC term, which is the, the solid black line, drops down to the order of magnitude of one and under 10, certainly for the majority of the, the, the time series here. And so that says that really at that point with those dynamic, uh, the dynamic wave would be necessary. And so we looked at real river reaches, we looked at sort of some ideal rectangular cross sections. And then the last table here on the, the right is sort of a permutation table of what we looked at varying uh, channel slopes, channel roughnesses, and um, flow rates coming in here. And so what this work shows us is that across these test cases that we looked at, the pressure gradient can, is um, non-negligible in 97% of the cases. So that really means the kinematic wave, that the most simplified approach of this, the St. Bernard equations, really is a, a minor, minor use case, that, then it's not an appropriate um, assumption for, for almost the entire sort of space of our tests. The inertia terms, on the other hand, um, are negligible in 76% of those, those cases. And so that means the dynamic wave, that most expensive piece, um, really only might be necessary about a quarter of the time. Um, and then if we looked at a different sort of um, parameter looking at that F sub C term, uh, that sort of holds in, in the case that, that inertia is um, not really important 60 to 80 percent of the time. So looking at this, these are just one very specific test cases, but it shows that really the diffusive wave um, is probably going to be needed three quarters of the time, um, and dynamic wave is going to be needed, um, but, but not always. And so the problem here is to know this, to be able to determine these, these dimensional scaling parameters, we need to actually run the dynamic wave model. Um, and that is expensive, and we don't want to do that for every case. So how can we determine a priori where and when it's safe to make the simplifying assumptions and use the diffusive wave, or in some really rare cases, maybe kinematic wave? And um, so we're going to look at the continental United States, look at the NHT data set, and sort of um, take this framework that we use for the test cases and expand it to the continental scale. Um, okay, so my next few slides are sort of the workflow and the proof of concept of this. I mean, this is my PhD research, so it's still obviously in, in the early stages. But so here we have just the main stem of the NHD network. Um, so we looked at, we sort of paired this down to just large river reaches. I mean, the colors there are slopes. So red is just a steeper, a steeper reach. I mean, so what we can do here uh, from the NHD, we get the channel alignment length and channel slope. Um, and then we need to associate that with some channel properties. And so here we're gonna estimate a channel bank full width. So this is generally referred to as um, the flow that occurs from a, a, two, a two year flood. Um, and that's an important sort of geomorphic uh, principle. And through some work that Wilkerson et al. did, they uh, came up with some estimating estimating um, models to determine what bank full width is based solely off of the drainage area. And so using some tools that are off the shelf for the National Hydrography data set in the USGS stream stats tools, we can grab the drainage area and the two-year flow rate and then associate that with a channel dimension. Um, so we'll now have a channel width and we'll have a channel slope and a flow rate. And so that's sort of, we can build out those permutations that we looked at previously for the, the continental uh, United States. And this is, it removes complexities of needing, if we look at just the two year flow, instead of some of these larger floods, um, it removes the complexities of needing to, to have the connections to flood plains where you have a large change in cross-sectional area and velocity changes drastically there. And so this is sort of a um, what we're gonna do uh, to, to then spread this out across the entire uh, United States. And so the test case here that, that we've used and then we're gonna operationalize this um, was a steep river reach uh, outside of Missoula, Montana. So from stream shots, we pulled the flow rate, the basin area calculated bank full width, mean channel slope there 0.12%, um, and then the length. And so then you can see the hydrograph that we modeled. So that peak flow rate of 860 uh, cubic meters per second, um, and then the shape of the hydrograph at the upstream end there, and then as it attenuates downstream. And so if we look at these, these dimensional scaling parameters here, you can see again the F, sub C, the solid line there, is greater than 100 for the vast majority of these conditions. So that means the dynamic wave 
is not required. And the D parameter, which is the dashed um, line, the dot dash line, is actually less than 0 0.01. So that even means that this is one of those 3% cases where the kinematic wave, really the most simplified approaches to the St. Bernard equations would um, really be applicable. And so in, in conclusion here, sort of the next steps here, we're gonna build out those permutations um, for the continental United States. Um, we can look at, a, we're gonna look at a variety of um, downstream boundary conditions. So drawdowns, backwaters, and then obviously normal depth, which is what I just modeled there. Uh, we're, we're gonna look at an additional level of flow rate. So not just bankful, but smaller flows. Um, where the channel uh, dimensions might be a little bit different. And then we're also going to vary the hydrograph shapes and durations. We're going to look at um, sort of at what linear length scale is slope important to these parameters. Um, and then sort of uh, build out the permutations there. But the last bullet point is we're going to actually then be doing these model runs using both the dynamic wave and the diffusive wave and then calculating sort of the performance cost of um, both in terms of computational time and accuracy, and then put that all in the framework of these different channel dimensions um, and flow conditions, which can then sort of be algorithmed and turned into sort of some Boolean if-thens um, for, for operating, operationalizing this sort of multi-approach algorithm for, for channel routing in the national water model. Okay, and I think that might be about it for time, um, but there's some references there, and if there's time for questions, I might be happy to take them. Thanks, Eric. I think we do need to move along just uh, for the interest of time, but um, definitely send any questions or comments you have uh, via the Slack channel. So thank you very much. Um, we'll move along. The next speaker is Julie Dong. So if, if you want to go ahead, Julie, and share your screen. Sure, uh, I'm going to just share my screen. Yep, and he will be uh, presenting the Hurricane Analysis and Forecast System Standalone Regional Model Real-Time Experiments for the 2019 North Atlantic Hurricane Season and Future Developments. I can see your screen. Sure, thanks. Okay, go ahead. So uh, today I'm going to talk about the high-resolution F3-based uh, standalone regional hurricane model within UFS framework known as Hobson SAR. So first I would like to thank all our collaborators in EMC, LML, HRD, and TSL. So I'm going to cover two parts in today's talk. First one is 2019's HAFSSR HFIP real-time experiments for North Atlantic hurricane season. And second part is uh, some of the recent developments of HAFSSR. So the real-time, uh, the motivation of the real-time experiments is to demonstrate the capability of the f 3 based uh, uh, regional model, hurricane model on the convective scale hurricane forecast in a real time environment, and also to systematically evaluate the performance of the model by diagnosing and comparing the real time results with operational models. So, the standalone regional model has the potential to provide a high resolution forecast with less computing resource. So, the figures here show the domain setup of half the SAR on the left and the half global nest on the right, most running in real time last year. So Hapsar has a one large single domain to cover the North Atlantic Basin with about 3 kilometer resolution and 64 vertical hybrid levels. Here I lifted the, so here I listed the dynamics and the physics options for Hapsar, and the part in red shows the difference between the F3 based global GFS and Hapsar. As we can see, the, in the dynamics part, we choose to use a more diffusive horizontal advection scheme known as Horde 6 to keep the model stable. And for physics, we modify the PBL and the surface schemes with h wolf formulation over water to be more consistent with observations. At a three kilometer, we choose to turn off the cumulus convection. And there's no data simulation and ocean coupling in the real-time experiments. So before discussing the results, the so Hubsar real-time experiments running in real time four times daily for 126 hours forecast. And we covered 18 storms altogether for last year from Barry to Rebecca. So the figures here shows the seasonal statistics of track on the top and the intensity at the bottom. And we have plotted four models here, uh, half star in magenta, compared with two regional model, H Wolf and H Mon, and the one global model, operational GFS. And the X axis here shows the forecast lead hours. So as we can see, uh, half the SAR have a smaller track error, forecast error, and a higher track forecast scale compared to three other operational models showing here. 
and uh, improvement over each wolf for the track scale is about 20% for almost all the forecast lead hours. And for intensity forecast, HubSar have a relatively uh, uh, lower error than GFS, but the intensity error is higher than h worth except for day five. Uh, storm size is another important uh, metric uh, for storm surge prediction and wind damage area estimate. So here we can see HubSar have the relatively low error for 64 knots wind radius uh, prediction, but actually have a large size error in 34 knots wind radius, suggesting an old prediction of storm size. And we will come back to uh, later to the storm size prediction. So one of the high impact storms of last year is Hurricane Barry, causing uh, severe flooding and damage. So we can see Hubsar have a quite low track forecast compared to other three operational models. It follows the best track closely, particularly at the landfall location in Louisiana for Barry. And the lower two figures shows Hubsar captures the asymmetric structure when Barry made landfall due to the dry air intrusion and wind shear. So another important storm of last year is Hurricane Dorian. Again, Hubsar did a pretty good job with a smaller track forecast error compared to other three models. And the lower four panels show the track composite. Compared to three other operational models showing here, only Hubsar predicted no Florida landfall correctly. So a quick summarize for last year's real-time experiments. HubSAR performs better in track forecast than GFS, HWORF, and HMON, with about 20% scale improvement to HWORF. For the intensity forecast, HubSAR doing better than GFS, but uh, not as good as HWORF. 34 NAS wind radius uh, over-predicted, while 64 NAS seems OK. Not showing here, but HubSAR and the Global Nest are comparable in track intensity and size forecast. So next, I'm going to talk about some recent developments on HubSAR. So as we have seen before, there are some dynamics and physics differences between the FV3-based global GFS and HubSAR model setup. So we're wondering if these differences are part of the reason why the forecasts are different between GFS and HUBS, particularly for track and size forecast, other than the different resolutions. So on the top, we change the horizontal advection scheme from quarter 6 to quarter 5. Upper left, we have the wind speed at 900 millibar for Hurricane Michael. On the left is HUBS using HORD5, which is applied in global GFS. On the right, we have HORD6, which is applied in real-time HUBS experiment. So we can see HORD5 give us a smaller storm size, while HORD6 have a more smoother storm structure, since it is a more diffusive scheme. And on the upper right, we have the 34 knots radius error stats for Hurricane Dorian, you can see Horde 5 reduced the wind radius error compared to Horde 6, but it also decreased the track forecast after day 3, not showing here. And the lower figures show shows the results we turn on the scale aware calmness convection. So you can see the convection on reduced the wind radius error significantly on the lower right. But at the same time, again, the convection also increased the track error. So these experiments suggested the complexity of the dynamics and the physics options on HUBS forecast. We will continue to investigate these effects in the future. And also, as shown before, HUBS intensity forecast falls behind two regional models, HWORF and HMON. Both of them have high resolution. So we are interested to examine the resolution impact by increasing 3 kilometer to 2 and 1.5 kilometer for two single cycles of Hurricane Michael on the left and Hurricane Lorenzo on the right. So generally, high resolution have predicted stronger storms. Uh, the highest one, 1.5 kilometer, which is orange line there, shows the strongest storm and the closer to the best track. And the lower three panels shows the reflectivity for Hurricane Michael of these three different resolutions, so we can see the stronger storm, particularly the 1.5 kilometer, has more fine detail convective scale structure. So this experiment shows the importance of horizontal resolution, and we hope this could give us some experience when we're ready to move to high resolution simulation. So the last part I'm going to cover is about the grid specification. So the original GFDL grid has a non-uniform grid spacing. As we can tell from the upper left figure, the resolution 
decreases from a, around 2.6 kilometer around the corner to 3.6 kilometer in the center, and which is more of a problem for a large domain as Hubs has. Jim Purser have devised a more uniform grid, which is known as ESG extended Schmidt mnemonic grid with more homogeneous grid spacing on the upper right, which also can also help to reduce computing expenses. So I'm gonna compare the ESG grid with the GFDL grid. You can see the ESG grid improves the intensity forecast with a smaller intensity error and reduce the negative wind bias by predicting stronger TC with more category four and category five storms. Two minute warning. Sure, uh, this is for Hurricane Dorian. So in this year, uh, we're running Hubs SAR with ESC grade in the HFIP real-time demonstration. And we are also extending the forecast lens from five days to seven days for North Atlantic season, uh, for North Atlantic uh, hurricane season. And the right lower right figure shows a snapshot of Hannah making landfall in Texas as shown in the real-time experiment just a few days ago. So uh, Jim's talk tomorrow uh, afternoon will have more details on this uh, ESG grade. So future work, well, moving next, ocean coupling and inner core data, uh, satellite data simulation uh, capabilities, which are in uh, active development. And we are also developing a uh, basin scale half SSR with ESC grade with much larger domain to cover both East Pacific and North Atlantic basins simultaneously. Uh, I think that's my last slides. So I can take questions if there's time. Great, thanks, Julie. Um, I think we do have a, a minute. Um, Jeff, I don't know if... No, there's no questions. All right, yes. thanks. All right, well, if you have anything that comes up, um, definitely use the, the channel. So our next speaker is Ben Liu. So Ben, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen. And Ben will be discussing a standalone regional and ocean coupled halves for hurricane forecasting in the North Atlantic Basin. Uh, thanks, Catherine. Can you see my screen? Can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. All right, thank you. So uh, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit uh, some recent development about HAFS ocean coupling and its application for the North Atlantic Basin for the hurricane forecasting. So before I jump in the presentation, I first want to acknowledge the contributions from our collaborators, especially from the uh, Israel LASI group, as well as from our EMC uh, colleagues. So with that, so with that, um, here is my, uh, the outline of my talk. Uh, so I will go uh, with some uh, objectives and the backgrounds about HAFS coupling developments. And then I will talk a little bit about the HAFS V0.1A baseline configuration, which is on top of uh, GD's talk, last year's HFIP uh, real-time experiment. So after that, I'm gonna uh, uh, give you some more details about HAFS high con ocean coupling, followed by some preliminary uh, sensitivity study and uh, uh, retrospective tests, and uh, of course, some ongoing and future uh, works. So a little bit of background. So hurricanes are very strong LC coupled system in nature. Uh, the atmospheric forcing is very strong in a tropical cyclone, and it drives the ocean and as well as the sea surface wave. And uh, the ocean responses to the atmosphere, uh, the tropical cyclone uh, with cold wakes and SST cooling. We also have uh, tropical cyclone eddy interaction, uh, LC interaction processes via the LC interfaces uh, in both the atmosphere side as well as in the oceanic side. So uh, with that, uh, actually the ocean coupling has already been developed and used in operational hurricane forecast system including uh, the operational H12 model and as well as uh, in the operation H1 model. So we have learned a lot from those operation systems that ocean coupling is a very important aspect and uh, component, especially for hurricane uh, intensity forecasting. So with that, uh, moving forward for the half uh, uh, system, which is the UFS hurricane application, we definitely uh, definitely would like to incorporate this ocean coupling capability in the half system 
And uh, of course, the half system is targeting to be a uh, community-based and a system, a uh, coupled system moving forward. So uh, with that, uh, I will uh, first uh, talk a little bit about the, this year's baseline configuration because before we jump into the ocean coupling development, we want to make sure our baseline is kind of, uh, 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 we got a basically a good control experiment or good control configuration. So this uh, half v 0.1a baseline configuration is based upon last year's HFIP 2019 uh, half uh, saw configuration uh, as uh, GD just presented in his first part of the talk. So I will now need to go to more details about all these configurations, but I just mention some additional changes we added on, on top of that. So those are highlighted in the blue uh, color here. So basically we have uh, uh, another one full year of uh, modeling infrastructure, dynamics and physics advancement for the past one year also, including the dynamic core, the CCPP physics scheme and all their pre-processing and post-processing procedures. So we slightly increase the uh, uh, domain size from the north-south uh, direction. We further uh, increase the vertical level from uh, 64 level to 75 levels. And we added the capability developed by EMC Tom Black uh, with the lateral boundary condition blending. So that's a new feature added in this version. We further turned off the orographic gravity wave uh, drag option. And uh, another thing changed is the radiation uh, time step calling uh, from one hour to uh, 15 minutes. So with that, uh, uh, we did run this configuration for um, <clears throat> some selected 2019 North Atlantic storms, including um, from Hurricane Dorian to Hurricane uh, Lorenzo. So, if you look at the, the green line is in this uh, uh, slide, they are the new baseline configuration. The blue line is last year's uh, real-time experiment. As you can see here, we got uh, some pretty good encouraging uh, further track improvements on top of last year's experiment. As Ginny mentioned, last year, last year we already did a pretty good job in halves for the track forecast. So we are. Uh, it's very encouraging to see some further improvements on top of, the, of last year's configuration. Uh, in addition to that, we also see some additional overall intensity improvements. Uh, you can notice the uh, short time, short lead times forecast, we have uh, around uh, five to even 15% improvements for the intensity. Uh, you can also see the uh, intensity bias got improved as well. So we are, uh, it's good to know that we have a good baseline configuration. And then on top of that, uh, we are starting our hurricane <coughs> half ocean coupling development effort, which is uh, coupling F3 with HICOM. So the, currently the atmospheric co component is coupling to the ocean component through the EMSF, ESMF, the OPSI uh, coupler. Uh, we are using direct coupling between the two model components. And uh, in this study, we're gonna use the direct coupling by using the linear, by linear regrading method and also with the data merging method for those non-overlapped area. So that is will be the configuration we'll be using at the following experiments. Uh, with the ocean coupling capability available, we also went ahead and developed the half workflow for the uh, high con coupling, uh, basically for the, on top of the existing half workflow, we added three additional uh, tasks or jobs. Uh, the high con init one and two, which prepares emission conditions and uh, atmospheric forcing for the uh, high con model. And the high con post is uh, post processing the model output. So in the workflow, actually, it can support both uh, the coupled and uncoupled uh, uh, system. So. In addition to that, for the coupling option, we can run the two model components side by side. We can also run it by using bilinear uh, regrading, regrading method, as well as a linear nearest point uh, regrading method. So with that, we uh, come up our um, half V0.1A kind of final coupling configuration on top of the baseline. The red color is highlighted here is additional changes on top of the baseline configuration, which is further uh, increase the domain size from the north-south direction 
and vertical level uh, to 91 levels. And uh, of course, we need to turn off the NSST component and uh, by turning on the ocean coupling. So radiation skin also time step is uh, increased a little bit to uh, 30 minutes. The big difference is we right now have ocean coupling. So with that, we started running this configuration uh, for two, <clears throat> for a case study first, uh, for one forecast cycle of Hurricane Doreen, which is uh, August 29th, 00 Z cycle. Uh, two experiments we are running here. The first one is side-by-side -side low coupling, and the, uh, the red color is the one with the ocean coupling. I'm showing you in the figure here, just uh, pay attention to the two uh, experiments uh, compared with other operational models. You can notice this uh, uh, half configuration is doing much better in the track forecast than other operational forecast model in this forecast cycle. But to, yes, to only focus on the ocean coupling uh, um, impacts. So I want to draw your attention to the uh, impacts of the ocean coupling for this uh, one cycle. So you can notice for the intensity, there are some uh, good amount of differences between these two experiments. The first uh, <clears throat> difference between uh, about day two or day three, there are some uh, faster uh, intensification in the coupling run, but in the longer lead time, you have uh, uh, some weakling due to the ocean coupling. So with that, we also went ahead and check the <clears throat> large scale environment uh, difference between these two comparison two experiments. They look very similar to each other. That explains why we got a very similar track. So we also look at the, the storm scale uh, analysis. Uh, if you look at the, the top panel, which is coupled experiment and the bottom is uh, uh, uncoupled, you can notice the uncoupled do get a little bit stronger intensity. But if you look at the season temperature, you can see there are some feedback impacts here in the couple experiments. So further looking to the <clears throat> SST uh, response and SST cooling, you can notice that uh, uh, the uh, couple experiment do can see those uh, correspondence SST cooling uh, with the uh, storm, but in the um, couple experiment, you can probably notice the uh, SSD cooling or cold waves is actually not at the same location as the storm because that's driven by GFS analysis, a GFS forecast field. So I'm going to skip this uh, uh, slide by just mention uh, ocean response is uh, as expected. And I just want to move up to the next slide, which is some now for our. Uh, uh, we, so we kick it off a kind of small scale retrospective tests by using this. Uh, 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 coupling configuration. And right now, the experiment is still running, but we finished about uh, 50, more than half of the uh, focus cycles. And uh, I want to draw your attention about the Scion 9 here, which is a coupled uh, configuration. You can notice for the track, uh, we got some additional improvements for longer lead times, although we have some uh, degradations at the day two in the track. but. It is very encouraging uh, to look at the intensity forecast. So these couple of experiments do give us some very good amount of additional hurricane intensity improvements for both Vmax and uh, central pressure. Uh, you can probably notice for the uh, intensity bias, uh, it's kind of uh, weaker, which is kind of uh, uh, expected when you have uh, ocean coupling. So uh, for the Ongoing and the future halves coupling development, uh, we will continue running uh, these uh, halves uh, V0.1A H3 real time demo experiment during the, this hurricane uh, peak season in their uh, uh, reservation mode. So the results is available in the website. Uh, the link is posted here. And moving forward, we will switch to use CMAPS mediator for the uh, ocean coupling between the two model components and also uh, ocean coupling for the uh, high resolution vortex following moving nets uh, once the moving, moving nets capability is available. Eventually, we want to establish a three-way coupled system with the waves and also moving towards the coupled ocean system modeling under the UFS framework. Uh, that's all what I have. Thank you. 
All right, thanks, Ben. Um, I'm not actually seeing any questions and we do need to break up the session so that we can move on to the, the plenary um, session. So uh, I just wanna thank all of the speakers in the session and everyone that attended and let you